not just as the host of this channel, but as an Arsenal fan that sees his club with the title race in their own hands. And I'm scared. This is the Arsenal News Show. Hello and welcome to the Guna Talk. Back again with you guys for another episode of what is our Arsenal News Show. Joining you every single morning at 8am UK time. Thank you as always for joining me and making this a part of your morning routines. It is incredibly appreciated. I hope you've had a fantastic weekend. I hope you enjoyed all the footballing action because my goodness me, I did. Well, nearly all of it. There's there's some things that I'm going to complain about. Not Arsenal related, don't worry. Uh, We don't worry ourselves with the things that I'm going to complain about shortly. They are below us, quite frankly, Um, but I'm still going to complain about them. Um, Good morning to those joining us in the chat box. Apologies for the slight uh, lateness. I was trying to sort out the the connection. I don't think there's anything much more I can do than I I have done, but I was just trying to sort that out, and I'm hoping it's coming through clean, clear, and crisp as much as feasibly possible. Um, Good morning to Maximus, Amira, the Mask Cannon, Tony, Kevin. We've got Sir Nicholas. We've got Brad. We've got Jalali. We've got Barry, Colin. uh, Another Colin. Back-to-back Collins. Uh, I don't know if that's like, uh, is it like, um, is it the old magpies thing where it's like uh, one for sorrow, two for joy? Well, two Collins, I've got joy. Lovely stuff. Uh, Granddaddy Guna Paul, Jason, Chima, Robert. We've got Angry, we've got uh, John, we've got Ryan, we've got Amesy, Guna Pino, Trevor. Thank you so much, all of you, and plenty more for tuning in. Very much appreciate it. Uh, Babatundi, thank you so much for the very kind donation, my friends, and good morning to you. That's very kind indeed. So thank you so much. Um, incredibly appreciated. Let's start, shall we, with uh, the call to arms, uh, which is, of course, that if you are tuning in, maybe this is your first time. This is a show that we do every single morning at 8 a.m. Do subscribe. We've got a challenge to try and reach the Emirates Stadium capacity by the end of 2024. And we're closing in on 56,000 subs, uh, which is quite the uh, the feat. So thank you to all those that are brand new to the channel. Do subscribe. And if you are part of the show, you will know about our 1K like challenge every single day. We try and hit 1,000 likes every single morning show. and We've been doing that over the course of this entire title race. And I believe, personally, I don't think there's any kind of scientific evidence to disprove this, but it is the sole and primary reason as to why we are top of the table at the moment. So if you want to keep Arsenal top of the table at the moment, you need to make sure that you keep going with this superstition, and that's to get us to 1,000 likes every single morning. There's absolutely no scientific evidence to prove that this isn't the case. Just just putting that out there. Just undisputed. It's just what I'm saying. Anyway, let's jump into today's stories, and we can only start with one. And that is Manchester United drawing 2-2 with Liverpool at Old Trafford. One of the most nervous games that I have ever had the pleasure, I will say, in the end, rather than displeasure, of watching. Because it was one for the nerves. It was one where a cushion was quite firmly over my face, being held there by myself. I wasn't being, you know, there was no attempt at murder going on. Uh, But I was holding it. Because I just could not watch the last few moments of the game. I could not watch what was happening. I found myself very, um, I was almost, I'd almost bought into it. Like I'd almost bought into the idea that, um, that it was inevitable that Liverpool would score a third goal. As soon as I got the penalty in the 84th minute, I was like, there it is. You know, there's, there's t- at least 10 minutes. In fact, there was 13 minutes left. Um, and, uh, I just thought it's inevitable. Liverpool will score. There is no way that this Manchester United team that concede twice in the space of a minute in the 99th minute of a match against Chelsea can hold out against this Liverpool team. And you know what? They should have won, Man United. In the end, they should have won. That Anthony chance, as he runs through on goal, they should win from that chance. Man United had other opportunities in this game that they could have scored from and didn't. And the thing was, is that I saw a number of people tweeting, specifically Liverpool fans, saying things like, Liverpool always spurn so many chances against Manchester United. And they're right. However, what they're not including in that is that Liverpool this season, as a team, are one of the least clinical sides in the league. They sit, I think, in mid-table of the shot conversion rankings. I think they're around ninth or 10th at the moment. Perhaps they've dropped even lower after yesterday's game. They have loads of shots. And as I've mentioned before, if you stop Liverpool from shooting, you give yourself the best opportunity of winning. Usually it's about like stopping crosses, stopping deliveries. Stop Liverpool shooting. If you stop them shooting or at least mitigate them significantly and you can limit the amount of shots that they take throughout a game, 
you will have a massive chance of getting a result because their clinicalness is just not there this season. Because they take so many shots in every single game that they play, it often leads to plenty of opportunities to score. And in the end, they, you know, for a power of attrition, I guess, actually get the goal. But amazing, amazing couple of goals, to be fair. Bruno Fernandes latching onto Quantz's error from just inside the Liverpool half. And then Kobe Mainu again. I mean, he's produced some pretty big goals for Manchester United in pretty spectacular fashion. There was that goal he scored at Wolves, you might remember, earlier in the season. Um, and he scored a very similar curling effort here. Uh, but the, the big question mark was on the penalty. There's a lot of question marks about whether it was a penalty. Um, from, from my perspective, if that's Arsenal, and if it happens to an Arsenal player, that wan going in, I'm calling for that all day long. I know what we're talking about, about initiating contact, but the challenge is immature, it's silly, it's needless, it's really rash, it's just absent in thought, it doesn't need to dive in. I'm sorry, but I understand where people are coming from and why they're trying to claim it wasn't a penalty, but... It's such a silly decision from the defender to go in like that, as he does. And the referee is given literally no choice at all but to give that. And VAR is never going to overturn it. You can have a talk about how Elliot's going down or whatever. As soon as wan is going in, as he does, I'm sorry, but it's going to be a penalty. Like it, it just is. We can say that he's going to ground. I'm sorry, I don't agree. I think it's a penalty. And I, I just think it's a really silly challenge um from from wan and I have absolutely no qualms if it was the other way around you know if it was Arsenal there you all that's saying it's a dive you all saying if that was if that was uh Jesus going to ground we're saying it's better like yesterday I said even though um Lamptey got a foot on the ball yesterday I think there's enough of that rashness in the challenge that still makes it a penalty you know even though he touches the ball technically first before he makes contact with Jesus it's a penalty so for me I think uh, Machiavelli here is, is just says it in very short terms. Juan Basaka gave the referee absolutely no choice but to give that penalty. Absolutely no choice at all because it was a really stupid decision to go to ground as he did. Um, so we can all say dive and you're entitled to your opinions. But for me, he gave the referee absolutely no choice but to make that decision. And uh, he did rightfully. And so what does this mean? Well, it means Arsenal are top of the Premier League table with seven games left to go. Um, if Arsenal were to win all their seven games, the likelihood 99%, I don't see Liverpool clawing back that goal difference really. If Arsenal win all of their games, it'd have to be quite the turnaround. You know, you have to be scoring more than one goal per game more than, than Arsenal do. But it's a big, big ask. I think Arsenal have to win every game. From my prediction from this point is, is if we want to win the league, I think we're going to have to win every game. And it's not because of Liverpool, to make that very clear. Because I think Liverpool will drop more points. But I think City won't. I think City are just too monotonously, mechanically consistent and know at this stage of the season what they need to do to keep going and win. And they can do that. Liverpool, there's questions and that's why they haven't won league titles as many as they have and what they could have done despite picking up all the points that they can. For me, I think Liverpool will drop points. City are just... And as Ondavoli here says, are just on autopilot at this point. And they get fortune as well. We saw that with the penalty decision that what that didn't go. And I, I thought that was a penalty, by the way, that the Gavardio on, on Eze in the box yesterday, as we talked about. For me, it's a simple case of Arsenal. If they want to win the title, we have to win every game. And Sean says City won't beat Spurs. Do you know when they play Spurs? Do you know when City play Spurs? Because it's not at a point in the season um, where. Uh, where I think that it will help us. I think it's going to be probably the week before the North London derby. I'm pretty sure. I don't think Spurs are going to do us a favour. I think they'll recognise because Villa are so poor, Man United are so poor. I just can't see Spurs doing us a favour. Maybe I'm being cynical. Maybe I'm being immature myself in thinking that, but I just don't know why they would. <laughs> I re I just maybe maybe Apostacoglu is so principled that he would still go for the win. I just The, the likelihood of Spurs doing us a favour. I, I cannot, I cannot see it happening. Um, if it was Arsenal, I wouldn't want us to do Spurs a favour. You know, if we had basically to, in the position they're in where they basically have top four pretty much, like they are the favourites for that top, that fourth position. I think they can afford to drop points to City and still get Champions because it could be that fifth place still gets Champions League as well. 
Uh, Man United are so far behind at this point um, that I just can't see them not getting Champions League football. I just, yeah, if it was me and if it was Arsenal, that's the only time I think ever I'd want Arsenal not to win um, because I, I just couldn't deal with the, 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 the fact that Spurs were in the league. It's a really difficult situation, but if you're relying on Spurs to get a result against City, I'm sorry. I just don't know where that confidence comes from. <laughs> anyway, Jurgen Klopp was actually speaking after the game yesterday and he said that if it was Arsenal playing the game that they just played against the Man United team that he just played in the performance the Man United put in, he said Arsenal would win it. He said that Arsenal would win that. He said they've played Man United twice and they deserve to win twice. And they should have won twice and they haven't won twice. They've been, you know, held to 2-2 draws in the full 90 and, of course, got knocked out in extra time in the FA Cup against Man United as well. And his belief is that if Arsenal were to play there, call this mind games, call it what you want to call it. But if it, is, it is his belief that if it was Arsenal in this game, Arsenal would win. Now, Arsenal still have to go to Old Trafford. I, I look at that game. I know we've got to go to Spurs as well, which is never an easy place for us to go. And they'll have huge motivation when they play us. Massive. You know, they always do. But more than any other, they have loads of motivation to play us. And they might have had a significant rest compared to us when we do go and play Spurs at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Old Trafford has always been this strange environment where we struggle. This strange environment where we've won once in the league since 2006. And that was when we won 1-0. And there's that famous altercation in the post-match Sky commentary between Tim Cahill and Roy Keane. You may have seen it during the rounds yesterday or the last few days because it is one of the best pieces of predictive punditry that you will ever see from Tim Cahill. What Tim Cahill says in that interview is so brilliant and has come to fruition in such a special way. I don't know why Tim's not on... I don't, maybe he's working. I don't know what Tim Cahill does these days. Um but the fact that he's not doing more punditry based on just solely that piece of analysis, he says a former professional soccer player who plays an attacking midfielder, but also plays as a striker on many occasions. Is he doing anything? He currently works as a pundit for the BBC and Sky. Why is he not doing more? Tim Cahill on that interview alone should be doing way more punditry than he is. Maybe there are reasons why he's not, but if you haven't seen that clip of him talking about Arsenal after the beating you know, after him, arguing with Roy Keane, it is, um, it is one of the best pieces of punditry you will ever see. So I recommend going and trying to find Just type in Tim Cahill, Roy Keane, Arsenal. It will come up. It was from like four years ago when we beat Man United 1-0 and Aubameyang scored that goal. And we thought he was... I think it was the game we thought Aubameyang was offside. And it turned out he wasn't. I think we won 1-0. So yeah, that is, that is it. Um, so go and watch it. Now, the rest of the Premier League results from yesterday were mixed. We'll talk about Chelsea first because it's funnier. Um, Chelsea again somehow still managing to fail to win against a side in the bottom three of course they failed to beat Burnley they've now lost to another uh, sorry they've now drawn and dropped points to another late goal to another side bottom of the table Sheffield United McBurney with a 93rd minute uh, equaliser it leaves Chelsea sitting in ninth in the table they've played 30 games that game in hand they, they've got is with Arsenal I think they've got another game in hand as well. I'm not sure who that is with, um, but uh, one of them is against us. They could fall very easily into the bottom half if Wolves... Uh, Wolves are only uh, two points behind them. Bournemouth in 12th, only three points behind them. Fulham in 12th are only uh, five points behind them. And going up the table is, t is, is tough because you've got uh, Newcastle, you've got West Ham, Manchester United, Aston Villa, Spurs above them. Uh, Chelsea very easily could be finishing outside those European places for yet another season in a season where they could not afford to miss out on Champions League revenue, let alone UEFA Conference League revenue. So Chelsea is still wants to keep an eye on. Their summer is going to be very intriguing indeed. Very, very intriguing indeed. Meanwhile, the luckiest team in the Premier League managed to secure another win. Now, I watched the first half of this game, turned off for the second and, and kind of caught the highlights. But the first half of this game just wanted to make me vomit like honestly how this team gets so lucky and this is why I worry about going to Spurs because they just they're the most fortunate club in the country by a country mile it's so incredibly frustrating not only did Chris Wood miss the easiest shot of his entire career when he should have just lifted the ball over Vicario and instead smashes the ball against the post James Madison punches a bloke in the stomach and gets away with it he punches a guy in the stomach and gets away with it. It should be a red card and a three-match ban. And instead, the VAR looks at it and just waves it away. Unbelievable decision. Absolutely ridiculous. And then if you look at the XG from the game, which is another thing, 
Nottingham Forest end the game with a higher XG than Spurs. They had the better opportunities. They should have won the game, at least got a point from it. And Spurs still somehow, some, I mean, they got an own goal to open the scoring, of course, as well. Um, they are just the luckiest team in the world. And it's a difficult thing to compete with is luck. Luck's really hard to compete with. And Spurs are and have been throughout the course of this season through so many incidents, so many incidents. We late wins against Sheffield United at home, be it, um, or was it at the start of the season? There was another incident. I, oh, well, I mean, to be fair, against Arsenal, like Jorginho making the rarest of errors. The re- Raya, you know, at the start when he should have punched, should have caught it or, or got rid of it better and didn't. Um, it's just so annoying. <laughs> it's so annoying how lucky they are. But they are lucky. Um, incredibly lucky. And that leaves the top four race in a situation where Spurs are in fourth on 60 points, 10 points behind third place City. So they're not going any higher than that. Uh, Aston Villa also on 60 points, but they've played a game more than Spurs. Uh, I think Spurs' game in hand is against City. Um, bear in mind. So I think that's worth, worth uh, feeding that into. Man United are 11 points behind Spurs in sixth. So I just don't see Spurs dropping out of the Champions League place this season. No matter how much we hate them, it's still a big, big props to Ange Postacoglu for the job that he's done in his first season at Spurs. Like You have to be impressed with that, but he's been incredibly lucky. And Paul, I know you say luck runs out. I've been saying that they've been the luckiest team all season, and all I've got is people replying to me saying their luck will run out. It's still not running out. <laughs> it's, uh, Chelsea are also a team that they have a game in hand against as well, so thank you for that. Um Right. Okay. Let's let's move on to. I think the probably the most frustrating news of the day, um, and that's that the planned, or not planned, because it never got through the planning stage really. But the idea that Arsenal could use the fact that the entire stadium on Tuesday night, tomorrow night for the buying game of which I've had it confirmed I'll be going to, so I'm absolutely buzzing about that. But the planned TIFOs, the planned um, performance of like, you know, the banners and things like this that you can see on the screen. If you're listening on catch up or you're listening on audio platforms, hop over to YouTube for the 17th minute and you'll see what I'm talking about. This is what we've done in previous seasons in the Champions League in big games. We've done these TIFOs to improve the atmosphere in these massive fixtures. And of course, with Bayern having no fans in the stadium at all because of their ban, and we were able to have 60,000 for the first time, I think, in Emirates Stadium competitive history, perhaps, maybe I'm off on that, but I think in the first time in a competitive fixture in the Emirates Stadium's history, unless there's been other bans of of fans in other games that are escaping my memory, we aren't going to be able to do this. So Red Action released a statement yesterday, said there will be no full stadium TIFO for Bayern Munich. Our proposal was accepted from a design and sustainability aspect, but the overall cost was not approved. By the time this decision was communicated, it was too late to launch a crowdfunding appeal to raise the required funds. As a group, we are unable to proceed without full agreement from the club, so it's a real shame that there will be no special fan-activated display in place for our first Champions League quarterfinal in 14 seasons. From my perspective, this is really disappointing because I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that a crowdfund would have raised the the capital able to fund this. If it meant that every single fan in that ground had to pay an extra pound and fans around the world could have donated to this, we absolutely would have raised the money without question. All you need to do to see the power of the Arsenal fan base in this regard is go to Arsenal Visions fundraiser right now, which is raising money for a brilliant cause for the Zatari refugee camp. The hundreds of thousands of pounds that was raised last year and we're already closing in and we've had Elliot on the show to talk about this. The power of the Arsenal fans, the generosity of the Arsenal fans to make things happen, to improve things is so good. I have no doubt in my mind that had the had Red Action been allowed the, the time it took to raise the funds. Now, I don't know, of course, when the date of this proposal was put in. I don't know if it was from Red Action side put in too late. They're usually very organized. So I, I, I'm assuming that it was pretty, put in pretty early. Maybe someone can reach out from them and to let us know. But I'm incredibly disappointed by this. You know, I'm a big, <laughs> I'm a massive Arsenal fan. Of course, I support the club and I want to always see the positives of everything. And I always try and look for the positives and everything. But I'm really disappointed by this. You know, I'm really disappointed by the fact that this isn't and isn't going to happen. I hope that there is maybe some kind of explanation from the club as to why this happened. Of course, they've said that the cost was the reason. But if we'd have found out in time, we could have done Red Action, could have organized the crowdfund. This is disappointing. If Arsenal make it through Bayern, 
This is the chance that we've got. There is chances to get this back. If Arsenal make it past Bayern, which is a huge challenge, huge, huge challenge, and we get either of City or by Real Madrid in the semi-finals, we need to be on it. Yes, there's going to be away fans this time. And this was an opportunity missed in terms of, you know, in terms of getting 60,000 Arsenal fans involved in an entire stadium TIFO. But there's still going to be more than 50,000 Arsenal fans in the ground, you think, you, I, I believe, for, um, for a home capacity, for a home game. If we get to the semi-final, which is an if, Bayern Munich are a big challenge. You know, there's no guarantees. If we do, I really, really hope that we can communicate, uh, that the club can communicate with Red Action and communication can go on about a visual display that if the cost is not approved, that we can crowdfund it. Because I know that you would love to see it. I know that we would all donate towards it if we can, for those that can. And I know that we'd be able to raise the money because I know the power of this Arsenal fan base. Arsenal Vision and Ask Blogs fundraisers have proven the power of this fan base that we know when we can put our heads towards something special, we can raise money. Now, of course, what they're raising money for is more important, and it's important to point that out. But I think as an example of how this community, how this fan base raises money, shows you what we're willing and what we're capable of doing in, in really short spaces of time. So from my perspective, I really hope that if we do get past Bayern, there is a reaction, um, you know, because I think we should do better. I just think we can do better. So, yeah, if there's reasons, I really hope the club come out and explain it. But uh, from the perspective of just the information that we have from Red Action, my opinion based on just that information is that it is disappointing. Disappointing indeed. I'm kind of curious if Mikel Arteta gets asked about it in his press conference. And of course, that press conference is today. He will be facing the press ahead of the game against Bayern Munich tomorrow. Uh, so we'll be hearing some updates on the latest team news. Of course, how players are getting on. Maybe something on Jury and Timber. Uh, today, there is also a under-21s game. And the reason why that is important to raise that there is an under-21s game is just I'm curious to see if Jury and Timber is involved. If he's not... He might not be, but there is a very... I haven't heard anything, by the way. This is me just speculating. There's always going to be a very small chance after what Arteta said about the under-21s games. There is an under-21s game today. Be curious to see if he is involved. If not, the next under-21s game is a week today, next Monday. Um, so let's let's see. That'd be great, though, if he's involved in some way, shape, or form. Um, but I don't know. I've had no indication to suggest that that is going to be the case. I'm only going off of what Arteta said in a previous press conference where he mentioned that uh, he could need some under-21 games, of course, one or two, he said. So let's see. But Arteta will be facing the press today, um, so look forward to that. Well, that was a really long part one. So uh, there was loads of stuff to talk about, and I wanted to get through it all. There is over 1,800 of you watching across YouTube and Twitter. Um, please do subscribe. <laughs> Drop a like. Thank you so many for all of you tuning in. This might be the highest. We might get to 2,000 for the first time in this channel's history for a morning show. I say that maybe when Partey signed, it was the highest viewers we've ever had live concurrently. But this is one of them. Let's go to part two, where we're going to tackle your questions and more in the chat box right after this. Okay, then let's jump into the chat. This is the part of the show where we tackle your questions, queries, theories, and thoughts. Uh, so let's jump in and see what we're having a chat about. Ames says, Welcome back, Harry Kane. <laughs> Indeed, it, that is going to be the, the entire narrative. Expect loads of talk about Harry Kane tomorrow and today. I expect Arteta will be asked about Harry Kane. I think Bayern will be asked about the narrative between Harry Kane. Um, I'm trying to think who the Bayern player is going to be in the presser. I think it is. It's not Harry, uh, but it is an English-speaking player um, that we'll hear from the Bayern side tonight at the Emirates. Um, Pat says, hi, Tom. I'm 50 years young today, and I'm going to the Villa game. It would be great to meet up with you before the game. Pat, mate, I'm always around um, before the games, uh, usually around the Armoury area about two hours before kickoff. Uh, happy birthday, and I hope you have a fantastic day. I can't promise I'll see you, but I'm always in the press box for the home game, so if you're in the area, it's always nice when people come and say hello. Uh, Anna Seymour says, our run is, not, is something like battling Thanos and the Hulk. City are Thanos with their inevitability, and Liverpool are flawed but near unstoppable with emotions on high. And we're like Thor, aiming to be the <laughs> aiming for the head this time. Yeah, I mean, we just got to hope that, that we learn from the mistake of last season where we didn't 
we didn't do that, did we? I love the Marvel analogy, though. That's great. Um, Ashmal says, I wasn't exaggerating about Kai's golden boot potential with our penalties. He and Cole Palmer have the same non-penalty uh, goals. Uh, look at where Palmer is in the golden boot race. Arsenal had nine penalties this season. I mean, to be fair, Ashmal, that's a very well-constructed argument. That's that's quite incredible. Shall we do a quick FB ref comparison between Havertz and Carl? Because Cole Palmer is being raved about as one of the greatest players of the season. He's been talked about as by Chelsea fans and suggesting that he should be um that you know that he should be being talked about as one of the greatest players to ever go to a club in their first season. Let's have a quick look, shall we? Let's get the results of this season between the two. So non penalty. Uh, non-penalty goals. Goals minus penalty. They're both on eight. This is Premier League. They're both on eight non-penalty goals this season. Um, to be fair, Cole Palmer does have 16 assists, um, which is a quite incredible number. Um, Kai Havertz has nine. Uh, assi- uh, sorry, Kai Havertz has five. Sorry, no, he doesn't. I'm, I'm messing up. Cole Palmer has nine assists. Um, and Kai Havertz has five assists this season. So uh, Havertz is four goal contributions behind Cole Palmer. Um, in terms of non-penalty XG, Havertz 8.1, Palmer 6.1. Um, so he's outperforming his XG, whereas Havertz is actually just 0.1 below. He's actually performing as expected in terms of the chances <clears throat> that he's had, whereas Cole Palmer is exceeding those, which you could argue is maybe unsustainable, but the best players do tend to exceed those uh, XG statistics. So yeah, that's that's very, very interesting indeed. But Palmer's had a better season. I don't think it's any kind of crazy. He's carried Chelsea. Without Palmer, Chelsea would be absolutely nowhere. But Havertz has still had a brilliant, brilliant season. Um, but uh, I see what you're saying regarding the penalties. Maybe he would be up there in the golden boot race as well. Um, winning ways, says Gabby Timber, and a fit parte is needed if we can get it over the line. Their quality adds something to keep this team uh, working hard, uh, making us harder to beat, and better players on the ball as well. Uh, Spike says, if there's not enough contact when the defender fouls an attacker, does it follow that there can also be not enough contact on when a defender gets a nick on the ball before a penalty? Uh, probably, I guess, by it, because in terms of um, the penalty we got, you know, against Brighton, I guess that is that is the case. He didn't maybe didn't get enough of a meaningful contact on the ball compared to his contact on Gabriel Jesus. So I guess that that was the judgment that was made in the VAR booth as well. Um, TJ says, Palmer is beyond comparison, apparently. I don't know if I trust the stats, Tom. <laughs> Indeed, the way they talk about Palmer is... He's having a very good season, but, you know, let's be honest. Kai Havertz has been transformative for us. He's been so good. He's absolutely muddied all of his critics this season. Uh, Snaggies says, um, we've got to keep Kane trophyless. Bayern have been smashing the Bundesliga for well over a decade. And as soon as they sign two Spurs players, they've lost it. Well, hopefully that will be the case this time around as well. Uh, Olu says, after the great start by Joboslai, Doku and Madison, they have all slowed down. And Havertz, on the other hand, has been great. How important is it for fans to allow players time to settle? Well, what will happen next season if we sign somebody and they have a slow start? We have the greatest example in the world of how and why Arsenal fans need to be patient with players. You know, we need to give these players chances to settle. I think Ben White's another really good example of that. It wasn't as slow of a start as Havertz's was, but it still was a slow start for Ben White. And he's had to adapt to a new position as well, as has Havertz, to be fair. He's moved into that centre-forward role despite starting in midfield. And I did say, I had been saying for a long, long time, and a lot of people, I got a lot of pushback for saying this, but I kept on saying, get Havertz out of the midfield. Kept on pushing, saying keep him away from the number eight position and you'll see the best of Kai Havertz. I'm, and I'm glad that I've been justified in that view and vindicated in that view because I had a lot of pushback saying, no, keep him in the midfield. You know, we've got Jesus to play centre forward. We've got Trossard who can play centre forward. No, keep him out, keep him out the midfield. Play him in that forward line and, and we've seen how good uh, we've managed to get from those um, from that as well. Um, Nick says, Tom, do you think that Man United will be able to hold on to Kobe Mainu? I think so, yeah. I mean, they've managed to hold on to Rashford for an incredibly long time as well. The players that come through the Manchester United Academy, you know, there's a big attachment to that club um, and they feel compelled to stay at that club. So that's important. Um, Nick says, Tom, who... Oh, sorry, we just literally, I just did that. That shows my incompetence in the morning. I can press the same button twice. Um, Sean says, Chelsea are in the mud, so they always look for every petty thing and would turn to it for a win. Palmer is not playing under pressure, Tom. This is a title race, not a (laughs) mid-table rubbish. Um, King says, Tom, who is your favourite to win the Premier League now? Did Liverpool bottle it yesterday? Um, 
Yeah, they did. Um, and they absolutely did. They were it was, Man United were there for the taking and they didn't. So if Man United, if Liverpool don't win the league, they've absolutely bottled it. Man City should still win it, in my opinion. I, I, and they're still my favourites, Man City, just because of their consistency, just because they've got they've gone and done it. It's impossible for City not to be favourites. If we'd have beaten City, it was ours to lose, in my view. It was ours to lose if we beat City because of what that would have meant, the momentum it gave us, the, the value of, of that. I said that before and I maintain that now. It would have been ours to win if indeed City had been beaten. But City are still absolutely the favourites at this point. Have to be the favourites. And I assume that they'll be the case in any of the um, the metrics. I don't know if there's... Do 538 still do? Uh, let me have a look. 538 uh, Premier League... I'm sure they used to do the uh used to be able to get kind of a, a percentage kind of feel about um things from them. Premier League predictions from 538. Is this update? Oh no, they've not done it this season. That's a shame. Um I don't know why they've not done it this season they did it. Um but yeah, this season they've not done it. Uh, I don't know what the uh the percentages are in terms of the algorithms prediction models uh, for where they're ranking different things, but City are probably top um right now. Arsenal could be second. But they're probably still third. And I think that comes from experience. I think it comes from just like the experience of not being in the title race uh, in the same way as we were last season. Uh, Sophie's in the chat. So good to see you, Soph. Uh, Sophie says, I'll tell as Arsenal Avengers fight on Kai Hawkeye Havertz, the hero yesterday. <laughs> Why Hawkeye? Of all of the Avengers, is it just because of the HJ? Is that the reason? I need an explanation for that, Sophie. Um, I really do. Is it because he's the underrated Avenger? Is that the reason why? Uh, Winning White says, Poch and Tenag are the most overrated managers ever. And I bet, man, you wish they had Oli in charge now. Oli should get another job in the Premier League, but his name is tarnished. Um, he got top four and finished second as well. Yeah, he, incredibly underrated achievement what Oli did with, uh, with Man United, it turns out. Eric Ten Hag was pined over by so many supporters, even Arsenal fans, when Arteta was at his lowest. Ten Hag was being pined over and wanted by Arsenal fans to replace him. Thank goodness the club did not do that. Thank goodness. Uh, Sean says, I'm sure Mikel would have spoken to Javier Alonso, Javier, uh, and Granit Xhaka about his buying game. And I'm so glad there is no golden goal. I see us battering them 4-1. I'm, yeah, I, it's the most confident I've ever been going into a game against Bayern. I've never thought Arsenal were favourites going into a game against Bayern before today. Arsenal are absolutely favourites for this game. You know, I'm I'm not touching wood and all that, but, you know, it, it, it's just a fact. Arsenal are the favourites going into this game. By me, losing to Heidenheim at the weekend. 2-0 up, 3-2 final result. Arsenal need to get a good result at the Emirates. They need to go into the away leg with a good result and a good um, uh, and a good position in, the ta- position in the table. A good position to go there with kind of a good aggregate score. And Arsenal, I think Arsenal know they can go to Bayern and hold them. And potentially even get a clean sheet. You know, they've been so good against attacking sides this season. They've conceded so few goals, have Arsenal. It's really exciting. We have a nearly full fit squad. The only player that's not available, Touchwood, is Yuri and Timber. Incredible opportunity for Arsenal here um, to, to go into that game against Bayern and potentially, you know, potentially be back um, amongst the elite and prove it. All those years of those words of, we want to compete with Bayern. This is the first opportunity Arsenal might have, I think, in their history to knock Bayern Munich out of a Champions League. I know we lost to Bayern Munich, I think, was it in 2005, um, in the last 16? So, great opportunity here to uh, get a first real blow to Bayern. Uh, Phil Ed says, I'm not blaming any side, but the communication between the club and the supporter groups, although is better than before, still needs improvement to avoid the TIFO and ticket allocation stuff, in my opinion. The ticket side... I've got more sympathy about because there's a lot of touting going on. The club are doing all they can to try and tackle that. But this TIFO thing, from the information that we have, which is only coming from Red Action, of course, from that information, it should be better, in my opinion. But I'm only you know, privy to, to that side of the story. Maybe there's more to it. But uh, at the moment, based upon what we know, that it should be better. Should be better. Uh, Tyson says, Hi, Tom. Can retrospective action be taken against Madison for that punch due to it being a bad error by officials? Also, no one talking about the penalty Palace should have had. Um, but ours has gone, been gone over, over and over again. I'm not sure um, because of VAR in this day and age. Before VAR, what used to happen is a player could be investigated if a referee didn't include it in their report. If the player included seeing it in their report, nothing could really be done because they'd acknowledged it. 
And because VAR exists these days, maybe referees, if you, you know one or are one in the chat box, would be able to clarify this. But because of VAR, because it can log the incidents and it can obviously retrospectively act, I don't think we have that anymore. The only thing we retrospectively have these days is apologies. That is it. That's the only real thing that we have. You used to be able to get retrospective action towards different things. Um, these days, I don't think you can because of VAR. So he should have been sent off. Absolutely no doubt in my mind. Um, but uh, without doubt, a very frustrating situation. We're very close to 2,000 concurrents on this video. It's exciting. We're probably going to keep going until we see if we can do it. Uh, Madupe says, a bit more personal question, Tom, but what is your long-term slash dream ambition with your career? Is it to work for Arsenal, continue with journalism, become a full-time YouTuber or something else? Um, working with Arsenal, you know, you think in your mind's eye that you think that would be amazing. That'd be great. And I'm sure it is. And I think it's a dream job for so many people that currently work for Arsenal. The issue that I've got is I love doing this channel. And, you know, you, I could not be, I could not work for Arsenal and do this channel. There would be a conflict of interest because I, I, I'm critical here. And, you know, if you work for a company, if you work for a brand and then you run something where you're critical of your the brand you work for, there's a conflict. So it would be impossible to do this channel and work for Arsenal. You can't do both, you know. Um, and for that reason, I don't think working for Arsenal, in, in, in the short term at least, very much so in the short term, who knows when I'm much, 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 much older. But while I'm doing this channel, there is absolutely no way. And my channel here, the channel is always going to be something that is, is so ingrained in me to keep on doing. I'd love doing this channel i love doing what i'm doing with this channel and um just seeing where we can go it is absolutely a dream one day to reach 100,000 subscribers because i feel that the, the thing about hitting 100,000 subscribers with this channel for me is it's it's a vindication of the community it's a vindication of you guys it's something which i feel that we try and build in the right way we don't grow this channel by shouting and screaming and being abusive we don't grow this channel by you know how media has changed today where um that you say the most controversial things possible it gets you jobs it gets you attention it gets you money it gets you gigs you know i don't i have no interest in that i just want to be as grounded and objective as possible try and fight the good fight try and address difficult problems difficult issues do more live events, as Grantly Poos here says. Yeah, absolutely. I hope to do one of these every single year. The last two we've done in 2024, the one in 2023, amazing events. And I loved every second of doing them with amazing guests. We've made such amazing friends um, with other channels as well. But yeah, it's an absolute dream to, to reach up that 100K. You know, I don't ever see like the crazy you know, figures that, you know, the, the biggest YouTube in the world reach. I just don't think that's feasible, um, especially because you've got AFTV. I think, you know, they own that space. They, they've got that space kind of locked. But to reach 100K is, I think, you know, you look at somebody like Babs. What an amazing achievement, Babs. Babs has put an incredibly hard work to do what he does. The editing that he's learned to do, you know, the, the consistency of his uploading, the quality of the production that Babs does is amazing. Um, and he deserves all of the plaudits and all of the success that he's getting because he puts he's learned how to do it and he's put all the work into creating that channel and fair play to him. You look at Alex who comes on the show from the different knock, he's doing a very similar thing, the way in which he's producing fantastic content. It can't necessarily be on such a regular basis as we do here because we do live shows. This is what we do. I'm not one to be putting out edited content in that fashion. I'd love to. I just don't personally have the skills or the money to invest in an editor at the moment or have a you know a close friend who's an editor um, at the moment. It's something I'd love to do in the future, especially long form content. I'd love to be able to do like a, a, a doc series or something like that in the future. Um, certainly an ambition. But like Alex... I have no doubt will be going towards 100,000. You know, he's already on 60K, I think, and it's still a relatively young channel because he puts out fantastic content. Um, Charles Watts, you know, somebody in the space, in the journalism space as well, that is now, I think, on very close to 100K, 90-something plus thousand subscribers. Charles is, you know, he's just a genuinely good bloke that does really good things. And then you look at the vision, you know, Clive obviously comes on the channel, Elliot's come on the channel, Paul's come on the channel, Tim was at our live event this year the things they've done, the numbers that they bring in, it's because they produce solid and good content, you know, and, and that's that's the main goal. It's just to continue producing great content. In terms of the journalism side of things, Football London have given me amazing opportunities. And I my long-term ambition is to continue staying with Football London and going to games and covering things and producing good content for Football London. 
Um, they've given me a great opportunity. I don't have a journalism degree. I didn't do journalism at university. Um, I did geography. I went into teaching secondary school girls, you know, and going from that into journalism without any qualifications besides just working hard on the side with the channel, with working, volunteering to work for free for websites, to write articles for nothing, to build up a portfolio, to just grind and grind and grind till eventually somebody being 101 Great Goals, which was another website I used to work for, gave me a job so I could quit teaching, work on minimum wage, writing six out of seven days a week, doing the channel on the side, and then eventually a job came up with FL. Um, I'd actually applied for jobs at FL before and not got them, um, but this time just got you know, incredibly fortunate and a massive thank you to Tom Marshall Bailey who gave me that opportunity. And of course, my current boss, Lee Wilmot, who's, who's kept me on in my current role now. And I'm still doing what I'm doing. So thanks for the question, Madupa. I don't really have had an opportunity to talk about it like that. But the main thing for me is, you know, just keep doing what I'm doing. Keep producing content for you guys. Aspire to 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 reach the heights that to others that others can because it's possible. I think people like Babs who put out the content that he does. I think people like Alex who's doing the great things that he does at the different knock, you know, it shows you the traction. It shows you the success that you can get by just being genuine, by not trying to be controversial, by just putting out really good content. And um, we certainly aspire to do that. The thing that I am most proud of with the channel and the thing that I'm most proud of, the thing that despite other channels having more subs than us, you know, which is is never a measure. It's always something I want to achieve is to get to that 100K. It'd be an absolute dream to hold that. You know, and, and myself and Umar and Bailey and Chris and Charlie and those guys, we, we work really hard on the Arsenal way. We reached 100,000 subscribers in two years on the Arsenal way collectively as a group umar being a big shining light of the of the channel and the, the hardest worker for me there you know charlie did some great work behind the scenes alfie as well did some great work as well and you know, people behind the scenes who started things at the start you know the arsenal way reached a hundred thousand subs in two years and we worked on that channel really really hard as part of my job i was just a presenter it wasn't my channel it was just my job like i was just, part of being at football london was doing that channel and it sucks that we don't do as much on that channel. There are plans to keep that going, of course, with me and Kaya still here and hopefully bring about the podcast again soon. It's so inconsistent at the moment, but hopefully we will bring it back. Um, we, it showed what it's possible. You know, It showed that, you can, that we can be part of things that can reach 100,000 subscribers in the space of two years, and we did that. And it's the dream for this channel to, to go to those places as well and to continue talking about really important things like you know women's football and the fight for that. Um, and really important topics that are very close to me as well. So, but as I said, and as I started by talking about the most, the thing I'm most proud of is you listening, because this community is the best on the platform. If you meet other, if you meet other parts of this uh, family, if you go to the games and meet others, I know people have made lifelong friendships from just being in this chat box by joining the Discord, by doing whatever. People have made lifelong friends through this channel. I've made lifelong friends through this channel. And the support that this community gives is unrivaled beyond all measure. So, you know, I'm not that's not to say other uh, channels don't have great communities. They really do. But for me, and I'm very biased, <laughs> absolutely very biased, but I love this community. Absolutely adore it. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. And uh, it's because, you know, we... We don't stand for we don't stand for abuse. We don't stand for people bullying people. We don't stand for people not respecting other people's opinions. And I'm not perfect either. And I've definitely had to U-turn on some decisions. I've banned people maybe too quickly sometimes, and they've messaged me, and I've had a chat with them, and then we've gone back and forth, and you know I've unblocked them because I've realised you know what I was too harsh, and I've definitely been too harsh at times on some people on some really tough views and topics as well. And I have to hold my hands up sometimes and say you know what? I got that wrong. Sorry about that. You know, so I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not too proud to, to admit where I've gone wrong with something. So I'm, I'm more than happy. I'm happy to call things out if I think they're unfair, for sure. Um, but if I'm wrong about something and I know I'm wrong about something, I'll hold my hands up about it. But um, thank you so much. Nick says, how many subs are needed to do YouTube full time? It's not about subs, Nick. Um, it's never about subs how many subscribers you have. There are, you know, there are channels out there with loads and loads of subscribers, but don't, you know, produce enough viewership necessary to live on um i do, i do this as my job and i have a job it's not even this is a job it's, this is still technically a hobby you know in in many ways because my job is being a journalist 
and everything I do on this channel is outside of my work hours. I'm I'm not allowed to do things inside work hours on the channel, and that's absolutely fair enough. And that's why I do things always. So if there's a press conference, I'll bring the show forward. So like on Friday, was it? I think it was Friday, wasn't it? Yeah. So Friday, we didn't do the 8 a.m. show at 8 a.m. We did the 8 a.m. show at 20 to 8 because my shift started at 8. So I can't conflict with that. And the, the channel can't take precedent over my job. So the job always has to be number one. And the channel is always done outside of those work hours. And that's that's absolutely what it has to be. Um, Madupe says, yeah, I was previously banned. <laughs> there you go. This is what I'm saying. If, if people are listening and they've been banned, I'm more than happy to have a conversation with people about it. Uh, um, you know, people make mistakes. People say silly stuff. And sometimes I make mistakes and are too quick with my ban hammer, which I get. But the reason why I'm very quick with the ban hammer is because I really care about the community and care about preserving a space that is safe for people to come in where they're not going to be abused. They're not going to have to be subjected to some pretty horrible views. You know, that's why I'm very quick with it and sometimes too quick which is why i have a twitter why i have an instagram why i have an email you can reach me in all those places to chat you know so and i do reply i think people will tell you that you know i, I try my best i'm never going to get to everybody um but uh I, I try my absolute hardest to reach out to everybody that messages me as best i can sometimes i'm i'm too obsessed with it and sometimes i wish i didn't have to have social media i do Sometimes I wish I didn't have to have it because if I, you know, having it is a problem. I, I'm pretty certain that I'm addicted to it, which is never a good thing. I'm happy to admit it because I know it. And if I didn't have to have it for my job, um, I wouldn't. But sadly, I do have to have it. And you then get into this, you get into a cycle of constantly refreshing your notifications. You're constantly looking at comments. You're constantly looking at views. And they're not always positive. I had a really good conversation. I bumped into FK actually on the way to the Emirates Stadium the other day on the way to the Luton game. And we had a really good chat. And I was very open and honest about where my headspace was at in returns. Because the last year, I'll be very honest with you, the last year, the abuse toward me has gone through the roof. Um, I'm not really sure why. I don't necessarily know what I've done to deserve that level of increase in abuse but the abuse has gone through this isn't me you know this isn't a cry for help or anything like that i'm just being very honest with you the abuse towards me has gone through the roof in the last year very strange don't really get it um i always understand that people are going to have very strong views on some topics you know i've covered some very difficult topics um we did a video dedicated to the abuse that declan rice suffered online i got a lot of heat for that did a lot of I did a specific show about the treatment of women's uh, women in football with Laura and Sophie. I got a lot of heat for that, as did they. I, I don't know specifically the reaction they got, but I certainly got heat for it. I did a show talking about um, the reaction to some of the comments when talking about women's football. Got a lot of abuse for that, you know. So, but the last year things have gone through the roof in terms of, and, and that probably comes with the territory as well. You know, being in the space, going to games, working in the space. Um, being your face is out there more the channel's growing you're currently if you're watching this right now live you are part of the highest number of viewers concurrently on a show that we've done at 8 a.m there are across youtube and twitter at the moment 1800 people watching which is and i'm so incredibly grateful and i'm quite glad that madupe asked this question to spark me off on this bit of um you know a bit of a rant um here uh but i'm quite glad to talk about this quite an important topic in front of as many people that are watching right now but yeah it's um and Derek says what sort of abuse unfortunately there's always going to be haters absolutely and it's sometimes it's just people saying horrible things sometimes it's people just for the sake of it saying pretty horrible things and you know I shouldn't look for it and sometimes sadly I do look for it and sometimes I just check because you always kind of want to be aware what the feedback you're getting is and I absolutely need to um get a lid on that I think take a tighter screw on that and to not go searching for it um there are some cases where i i definitely don't watch things that are certainly you know um or, or sorry read things that are, are dedicated towards me and i know they exist everyone's gonna have haters it exists it's part of it some people are just not very nice some people just aren't very nice people they exist and it's part of life you know sometimes they're just going to be out there and uh but the key thing is i think that you've got to lean on is that this community as i go back to is there as always a key supportive figure in my life and i'm very grateful for it 
So, yeah, once again, Madupe, thank you for asking that question because I think it raised an important topic that I think I needed to talk about on the channel and I'm glad that I've been able to do that. Um, and I'm glad that so many of you are tuning in, tuning in and choosing to watch the channel. If you are new to the channel and this is the first time you've watched it, well, you got deep very quickly, didn't you? Um, but uh, we do this show every single day at 8 a.m., you know, whether it's my wedding day, whether it's my birthday. <laughs> I do this show every day at 8 a.m. And that's not a joke, by the way. Yes, I did do this on my wedding day at 8 a.m. Um, I didn't do it the next day, it's worth pointing out, but I did do it on my wedding day. I wasn't doing anything in the morning, so, you know, might as well. Um, but thank you for listening. Drop a like, subscribe. Um, make sure you subscribe to the Hybrid Squad as well, Sophie, I can see in the chat box. And uh, of all the other channels I've mentioned on today's show, The Vision, uh, Different Knock, Bavs, um, Charles Watts, go subscribe to them. They produce some absolutely brilliant stuff. Uh, of course, very good friends of the show as well. Harry Simeon, Dan Potts, Lee Judges, you know, good friends of mine. Um, there are more. I always try and resist sometimes mentioning channels because I always fear that I'm going to forget somebody very obvious. FK, I've mentioned him. Go subscribe to Latte Firm um, as well. There's an amazing network of people um, constantly producing great stuff. And, you know, this is going to sound like a bit of an outcry here, but Grantly Poos has, has come up with it um, here. Don't forget to become a member, Grantly Poos says, who's been a member with us now for six months. If you can, and if you would like to, and only if you can, and you want to support the channel because we invest the, everything that you put into this into making this as good as it can be with new cameras, with things in the background, with the hardware, infrastructure. Um, I'm still in the process of, of talking to different people about merchandise. I, I need to reply to some people. I've been quite quiet on that front, um, but I need to get back in touch with some people at merch and stuff. We do non-profit merch. Uh, I don't take any profits from the merch when we run it. That money goes towards usually um cancer mcmillan sometimes we do gunners versus cancer um and we raise money in that way we raised um how much did we raise during the live event i think we raised a fair few hundred quids and arsenal were very kind to donate a shirt for that event as well to to raffle off so yeah thank you for listening appreciate your time have a fantastic monday and start to your week uh and as always up the arsenal